Looks like we have a bunch of topics and we shouldn't waste more time. So I, let's get started. Welcome everybody to CDS Raiders. And uh, over to you, Radek. Hello. Uh, hello, welcome uh, on this uh, on this meeting, which is basically a continuation uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the meeting during the uh, during the sister summit in uh, I apologize during uh, uh, during the uh, uh, development uh, summit uh, in Amsterdam we talked there and there a lot uh, about uh, about core things uh, and uh, clearly the amount of time dedicated there uh, was not enough. So I went to uh, bring uh, some uh, topics uh, from uh, from uh, its agenda uh, to hit the, to this meeting, but also extend it with uh, some new uh, topics that we got uh, in the meantime, which I think I are pretty important. Uh, let's start from the uh, first uh, uh, from the first point: op tracker for CIF MGR. It's a it's a direct uh, it's a direct uh, descendant of uh, uh, of a problem. We uh, it's a very severe problem, a very severe escal escalation. We uh, encounter it during uh, uh, and we encounter it uh, around CFFS. It was uh, uh, it was actually a dependency. CFMG uh, CF manager uh, some plugins uh, of it. Uh, store uh, store data permanently, and uh, uh, the MDS daemon is involved on this path. This makes uh, CFMGR, I think, one of the most uh, complex things to complete, com most complex demons uh, to analyze when it comes to performance issues. We have uh, multiple. Uh, very differentiated plugins under one roof, often with uh, queer, with very weird, uh, painful dependencies, like uh, the dependency on MDSs. And moreover, we don't have a ready-to-use solution for tracking uh, the operations in uh, in uh, CF, uh, MGR. Uh, to make the situation worse. Those plugins are written in Python. So if you want to go with uh, standard uh, uh, tools for dealing with uh, performance uh, issues, like let's say to profile uh, CFMGR using uh, uh, using uh, perf, uh, uh, perf tools, sorry to say, you will profile basically a Python interpreter that is a uh, Python virtual machine that it's embedded within. It's, I'm, I was really surprised that uh, uh, we haven't, uh, we, uh, there was no thing like dumps uh, uh, ops in flight available uh, to, uh, to monitor. The topic was already uh, discussed in one of the uh, CDMs. Uh, it turned out that uh, it looks there was there was no previous attempt to bring the common piece called op tracker. It's 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 shared between uh, between the monitor and, uh, and the monitors and OSDs are using uh, this uh, this piece. I think it's worth uh, uh, at least experiment to try to bring uh, uh, to bring uh, the Ceph MGR into grab of uh, of users of uh, of op tracker. This is for sure for Squid. Uh, it, we have some uh, <laughs> some ideas who could work uh, on this, but if there is any volunteer wanting uh, to to join to join the effort, feel free. Also, if uh, somebody is aware about any reason that uh, prohibits uh, reusing of op tracker within uh, CFMGR. Well, if we can kill uh, the project as early as possible, it's also uh, it's also beneficial.
Um, question about this feature, what parts of the code, I know it's generally related to the manager, but what parts of the code would this uh, cover? Uh, very good question. Initially, uh, initially mostly C++. There is uh, in ZFMGR in the handling of, uh, of, uh, of messages, uh, there is basically one uh, place where uh, we are uh, running into execution of, uh, of Python code. And at least to this, uh, uh, to this uh, region, we could, uh, we could, I think, we could quite easily uh, track uh, the operations. So at least we could know uh, what's, uh, uh, what's the Python module where some op got stuck. I'm not saying it must be uh, everything must be implemented in one go. Uh, we can we could continue building upon uh, on top on top uh, on top of, of it. We could try to pass uh, some kind of op uh, hand uh, handle uh, also among the uh, across the uh, the Python uh, the Python code. And did did you mention there's already an uh, MDS op tracker? Is that what you said? Uh, we have we have a common uh, tracked op. If I recall correctly, uh, there is a special. Uh, yeah, and basically all the ops. Uh, okay, I'm not. I the most important ops from in o, in OSD are deriving uh, uh, from the tracked op concept so it's compatible with uh, op tracker okay. but th th this piece is actually uh, it's a common thing it's it, it's shared among uh, among demos and i was surprised why uh, mdr doesn't make use of it yeah i was curious if there was um existing infrastructure that it could be modeled on so it sounds like um, there is i mean at least on spec to me it seems like a good idea any component once it reaches a certain level of complexity it's nice to be able to introspect this kind of thing and if the existing out tracker implementation is easy to to use that seems like a good strategy cool let's kick off this uh, uh, uh this effort okay if there is no more question about uh op tracker for mgr uh, let's switch to, uh, to the next uh, uh, item from the agenda, which is about uh, unit testability of uh, the encoding of the uh, decoding slash encoding uh, stuff. Uh, recently, we have it looks we have uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, three different issues uh, about uh, related. Uh, to, uh, to, the encode, to the encoders, and my impression is that uh, uh, we were mostly focused about when, when dealing with uh, uh, with uh, uh, encoding, we were mostly focused on the domain of clients, demons, versions of uh, of all those entities, and how they uh, interoperate, which brings uh, uh, problems to testability. I there is a uh, there is a change. Uh, uh, there was a change in MOSD op, very uh, very fundamental uh, thing, that got detected after three weeks after uh, after a match on, during the topology test. Of course, we have uh, some coverage there, but I think it's not enough. It's uh, far uh, it's far uh, too late. It's also very uh, hard uh, for developers. To make uh, uh, to make testing uh, uh, earlier, but uh, it might it seems there is a PR documenting uh, some of our encoding uh, stuff frameworks slash common procedures. I think that we could think about uh, uh, about uh, uh, the encoder about the uh, encoding stuff in far narrow down domain basically about the interoperability of uh, encoders with with decoders that's all 
we can abst we could abstract where they are uh, whether in which exact component those uh, those gizmos are living in and we already have uh, uh, such uh, uh, some some facilities related uh, uh, to it uh, we have a uh, uh, so-called uh, Ceph object corpus and Ceph decoder. Ceph decoder is a tool that is basically able to uh, to uh, work to run and code and run the decoding uh, stuff for every single uh, okay for many of uh, uh, till now till the needs and SPR for for it to run then coding stuff for money of uh, for money of the uh, of the uh, encodable types uh, but there is a clutch it's not uh, it's not if you are do if you are writing your class that it's realizable if you are used the right uh, encoder class macro it's fine it's allowed uh, to not register your freshly written class within self encoder. There is some kind of registry there, and it's not obligatory, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so even if you have, uh, you have no guarantee that by running, by, that by taking a look on, uh, on, uh, on unit tests, that everything's, uh, that every single decoder and, 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 and the code, Every single den coder got got tested. Uh, we agreed during our uh, last uh, CDM to change uh, the status quo. Uh, we are going to fail to fail the build if somebody written uh, a new encodable um, class but uh, hasn't registered it within uh, within uh, uh, within said encoder. And the idea is to uh, is to very it's to also extend the versions we are checking. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Junior, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if I recall correctly, we are uh, now we are testing uh, uh, just with the very recent, uh, only with the very recent version of uh, uh, versions as revision of decoder. So it's just, it's pretty far away uh, from what is being uh, used in the field. Uh, Nitsan and Junior uh, are work are working. Basically, have PRs uh, ready for review. Uh, that changes uh, this aspect. It also affects the the uh, the. Uh, there is another dimension uh, uh, apart from just the, the revision of encoder slash decoder. There is the there we have multiple modes, and I think Junior uh, could uh, uh, throw uh, some light here. Yeah, um, so for example, in stretch mode, um, we have this flag that would encode certain um, variables in PGPT types um, if we are in stretch mode. So basically, um, all the archived objects in the Ceph object corpus repository, it, there's none, none of them has like uh, stretch cluster um, objects in there. So at least for stretch cluster point of view, it doesn't get like tested. Uh, if you run like the script for um, for testing the encoder against decoder on different versions. Um, so I think, and this is not only stretch cluster, right? There could be other modes that you would only encode if you're in this, if the flag is set, if you're in this mode. And so I think, um it's gonna be hard but it might be worth to also incorporate all different type of modes um into the object corpus archive so that when we run like either integration tests or unit tests on it we would cover all types of modes um you know and running like uh, you know, server against clients in different versions seeing if it's like you know backwards compatible and everything yeah. Cool. Thanks. Uh, another thing related, actually, uh, to uh, decoding is our uh, is interoperability 
between multiple entities in the cluster. It's more about uh, formal, uh, formal uh, requirements than about uh, the coding itself. So uh, let me please uh, point to our review. I would really, really love uh, more input from. Uh, we have feature bits. And uh, we have uh, pretty clear deprecation rules. However, only towards uh, those feature bits that have never ever, even indirectly, exposed to clients. Because we have uh, the common rule N minus two. It apply. It limits the, the amount of uh, the, the number of version a daemon must interoperate with. Still, there is. In my impression is there is no clear stance uh, uh, about uh, about clients here. I hear. Uh, uh, I hear the very. Uh, I, I hear the um, stances that uh, we are uh, we are limiting to n minus three. I hear it on the on the contrary, uh, on the opposite spectrum side of the spectrum, that we are uh, basically uh, allowing uh, that we should care about even oldest organoid like clients. So it's uh, there are multiple stance, stances here, and it's hard. Uh, I would love to actually write some principles as a doc as a some kind of in some kind of written form this was actually covered uh, just uh, uh, 30 minutes ago during uh, and during the bluster uh, stand-ups it's we tend to discuss uh, complex problems uh, in a in a, in a pretty spread uh, manner spread by number of, of meetings uh, uh, cdms etc and to be honest uh, i sometimes i still don't i don't recall even uh, our uh, i it's hard to recall the stance we made so maybe we should uh, write maybe we should keep uh, a section in our development doc about uh, some very fundamental uh, rules about principles, like let's say I, those related to interoperability, like there was n minus two for servers, uh, for demons, n minus three or whatever uh, for clients. Still, this, this I, still I would I would love to get uh, some inputs. I would I would love to reignite the discussion uh, on this aspect. So um, just to um, clarify, um, the argument is whether we should support all, all compatibilities or should we only support like N minus three for um, clients, right? And N minus two for the demons? Yeah, there N minus uh, uh, three for clients. And actually there are, There are good points on both sides of uh, of the spectrum, but even if we uh, if we don't know, I would love to say that explicitly and put as a uh, as a in a written form. And I would love to do that before uh, before uh, before uh, Squid call, uh, goes out. Okay, uh, any input here? I know this is I, this is hard just, topic. I just know that in Blue Store there is a hard limit of how far I can go. It's basically one version. I think it's a great idea to write these things down, Radic. Um, I'm not sure that in the case of the clients, we can necessarily come up with a very precise rule, but I, I like, really like the idea of uh, codifying and making sure we also write down our, what, what we discussed and have uh, decided on as well, because it's easy to forget. Yeah, we can, I will, personally, I will, be per, I will be perfectly fine to write that we don't know. That we there is no clear rule, so be careful. So try to. Uh, uh, sorry, please go on. 
No, I was going to say, like, uh, what we know is that we test N minus three clients or whatever. We don't test infinite clients, right? But what we also know is that we are not trying to intentionally break compatibility for clients that are older than N minus three. So maybe that's the gray area that we document that we say that this is what we test. This is what, you know, the, the, what is unclear that we intentionally don't want to break. But I also get the idea about like, what if, like, you know, a new contributor wants to understand what our policy here is, like when they are trying to in implement new code, there should be a clear cut guidance as to what they should do. Right. So I, I, I get it. So we, we should at least start by writing this if, if there is no disagreement. Uh, yeah, let's let's write this down. However, it will be a bit more complex because there is even a, uh, there is a, there is a configurable uh, variable limiting uh, uh, the client version, and it's set by to, lim to luminous. So, yep, we need to we need to handle that. We need to do the document. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if no any, uh, if uh, uh, no any more input here, let's uh, switch uh, to another uh, to another topic. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Trello cards for mon config uh, profiles. Uh, it's a uh, there's even there was even a PR uh, by site. It's not a, a new thing. Uh, I roughly. The idea is to uh, is to uh, is to extend what we uh, extend uh, over configurables, what we did uh, in M clock uh, M clock uh, uh, story. In M clock, you have uh, you have a lot of uh, levers, a lot of tuning possibilities, um, but uh, those uh, those uh, uh, those options are pretty hard. So we created, uh, so we created profiles, and you can very easily set select. Uh, I want my cluster to be uh, to be optimized for recovery bandwidth, or uh, client uh, uh, ops, uh, or I want something balanced. Grouping options and their values, I mean, uh, easier to apply uh, profiles. And uh, if you go over the uh, Trello cards, there will be some use cases like uh, uh, like uh, the trades of between scalability and pressure on uh, on the resource like memory. Uh, you basically said everything, but I can continue because I started yes. to look at this. Uh, card so uh, as you said it was uh, originally brought up in, uh, in cds uh, a few years ago two years ago i think um, but uh, this uh, let's call it uh, feature or ability is uh, being requested again and we want to uh, be able to support it in in squeeb um the, the main idea the original idea was about uh, resource constraint de deployments versus like performance tuning um but I think it's a more general um, feature that will allow us to have a very, very, very simple and user-friendly way to, uh, as you mentioned, the M-Clock uh, profile uh, we had. Same with uh, lots of config, uh, config uh, values um, throughout the whole cluster. And this will be really easy to export and to apply um, to each um, uh, cluster and so on. So, the, the bottom line here is that we want to make it as simple and as user friendly as we can. Um, and if anyone has any suggestions about uh, actual, uh, let's say, initial profiles that you have in mind besides uh, um, resource constraints or performance or any actual config, there are in the etherpad that is in within the Trello some uh, initial thoughts there about actual um, options that we want to be able to configurable within a single profile. But if anyone has any further ideas to where we can take this forward, um, you're welcome to ping me um, or say it now. Uh, and I guess, I guess that's Well, just a, just a question without uh, asking uh, uh, for response. Is it thinking, is it, uh, would it be beneficial? It, would it be possible to move uh, uh, the 
mclock specific profiles to a broader tool Matan is working on right now. So Matan, I don't know that's the other. suggestion. <laughs> the mclock profiles are, I think, something you should look at as a use case that you should target being able to adapt as part of this. So you remove all the special purpose code that treat our edit for that purpose and port it over to the system instead. Yeah, I mostly agree. because and, and it partly that, because it's special purpose code that's kind of hard to read, and also because it's a real use case that actually exists. So this should be able to handle it, I think. Yep, Radic, the answer is yes. Short answer. Not so much time for uh, for this. Uh, we can we, if there is no any more, we can jump uh, for there. Well, I wanted to ask a, a few things. What's the vision for? What's the user sort of experience for um, deploying one of these profiles? Uh, I, as I see it, it should be the most simple command, like a profile set. Let's say if you had a, like a toy cluster or a performance um, targeting raspberry one, Pi. just what? Set on Raspberry Pi. Yeah, exactly. So just uh, uh, no, I, I just, I mean, continue. I mean, for an existing normal size cluster, let's say there's some profile that one of the M clock profiles, for instance, is this a file they need to copy locally and then reference with a with a monitor command? Is that the idea? Um, I, I'm not sure about this specific use case. As I saw it, this is, let's say you have a cluster and you already configured all your, um, let's say, um, values, you can export this as a single profile or just use a ready one that will be uh, supported once we uh, define what, what what is a profile. Um, this is more the way I see it, a more broad. Uh... So for the first use case, I'll point out, we put a lot of cluster specific stuff in the config map. So you'll need to um, allow list configs that actually make sense to export if we choose to support that feature. Um, for the other, are users allowed to apply more than one profile? I think they need to be able to, because um, I think it's likely that people want to apply, for instance, set of blue store um, tuning profiles, and also a set of uh, like M clock profiles or something. So I'd, I'd expect multiple profiles to be used at the same time. So the other thing I would encourage you to think about is what happens if two profiles mention the same config key? Yes, this is exactly the conflicts that are um, will appear once we. Um, this is the nuances that I will have to see how we want to uh, act on, um, and it's an issue that introduced by supporting multiple profile in a single cluster. That uh, maybe right. we should consider as an initial approach, just have a single one, and from there um, continue to support uh, multiple ones. Um, after we have this definition of what is a profile and how is a profile um, being applied or exported or used. And from there, maybe we should continue to the multiple options one. Uh, the other thing is, do you expect one. users to be able... Oh, go ahead, Rock. Uh, uh, just a suggestion about, uh, about real use cases. Adam was thinking for a while about uh, Using blue star, not in the, in the current shape, in the future, uh, for cold storage, almost like tape. It's a completely different uh, performance profile. So, okay, uh, not not uh, Raspberry Pi and, and toys, but maybe this cold storage. I mean, it would where still, you... it would still be just be a collection of config keys, right? So, yes, exactly, but. It still might be might bring some value to have some predefined and uh, dev uh, the finished project provided profiles to avoid to save people from doing from dealing with all these complexities like we saved during uh, uh, during the M clock story. It was perfectly fine in my understanding to live without those profiles, but nobody uh, would uh, the, the user experience will be bad. And that was acceptable. 
So you're arguing that for perhaps the first step here would be to create the ability to create project created profiles and then leave user created ones to later. Is that the idea? Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I was just I, going to I point out. Yes, I, I was thinking just in the interest of time, I, I see you all is asking questions about whether his topic is going to get to the list or not. Maybe we should take this topic to another CDM uh, and just brainstorm ideas uh, as to like which are the items that we want to target um, or the approach that we want to target for Squid. Clearly, it's going to be a moving target, right? It's not something that we aim to finish in Squid. Does that make sense, Sam, Madan, Radek? Sorry. Okay, uh, next thing uh, uh, on the list uh, uh, is about uh, uh, the QoS uh, phase two, so called client versus client uh, uh, QoS. Shitar, would you uh, would you want to jump and uh, throw uh, some light on, on this uh, on this region? Yeah, sure. Um, so this PR has been uh, in the works for a while now. Uh, so uh, the, the main focus on, in this PR uh, has been to uh, introduce uh, QoS between Librados uh, clients. So the uh, as far as the PR is concerned, uh, right now I'm in the middle of uh, testing the, the fairness aspect of it using the uh, Redos bench. Uh, at least for uh, when it comes to the throttling aspect, um, the chains appear to be working, but I need to do a more finer grained validation of uh, if the throttling is uh, is where it uh, is where it's supposed to be. So the, uh, that is still um, um, in the works. Uh, but uh, like uh, like the Trello card mentions, it uh, the this PR basically establishes the foundational aspects uh, in terms of establishing the the, the Librados APIs uh, that the clients can use to set up QS. And uh, the uh, Redos bench is now modified uh, to take in an additional option um, to enable QoS, and it uses the the um, uh, options. It reads options from the um, basically it reads a bunch of config options related to uh, QoS controls, and it um, establishes a QoS profile for itself. The client establishes a QoS profile for itself. And then passes the QoS parameters uh, uh, to the uh, via the objector uh, uh, to the OST. So those uh, those aspects have have been verified at this point. Um, the um, the idea is to get the first cut. Uh, uh, the review has been done once, but it still needs to go through another set of uh, another round of reviews. Uh, and then um, the other. Uh, uh, aspect is there are there were some comments in the review about uh, supporting uh, uh, clients with negative IDs. Uh, I don't fully understand the um, the the concept behind that. Uh, there is also some talk about uh, uh, the QoS profiles being shared between multiple daemons. So that's also still um, uh, up for discussion. So that's something that I need to add in, that I need to discuss further and establish. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the right now my focus is to uh, get the fairness aspect uh, verified, uh, and then uh, at least get the first cut uh, into the, the main branch um, as soon as possible. After which, I'll try to start focusing on the the other type of clients like RBD, at least uh, for, uh, in the script in the script time frame. So that's where the the uh, status is at this point. Cool. Thanks. Guys, if there is any input uh, uh, to this, any, any questions, feel free. Oh, uh, one more thing that I forgot, uh, or at least on the OSD side, uh, uh, I know the uh, Azure is working on um, a PR that um, for on the scrubs. Um, the, uh, I, we still need to um, do a similar kind of uh, change uh, with respect to snap trim and PG deletion operations. So that that thing is still um, um, that thing is still pending, and that should be uh, taken up during the script uh, during the script time frame as well.
Thanks. Is there any objection uh, for moving uh, to the next topic? If not, then the next one is about the uh, read balancer, but uh, well, online read balancer with uh, what I mean uh, by that. Uh, in Reef, we already have a read balancer as a separated uh, tool, as our tool requiring uh, users uh, interaction, basically as a, a CLI tool. Next uh, uh, step would be to uh, to squeeze the need for humans intervention, and uh, uh, in my understanding, that's the thing that uh, uh, Laura is working on right now. Do you want to uh, say uh, a bit about about this topic, Laura? Sure. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's um, this uh, new improvement would be to take the offline tool. Not uh, the offline tool, tool would still be an option, just like the uh, up map uh, offline option. Uh, but we would also be adding uh, the read balancer into the balancer manager module so that it will run in the background uh, and there won't be any further need for uh, users to keep rerunning. Because right now, um, since it's a new feature, we wanted to add um, offline and get user feedback that way uh, first. Um, but adding this as a part two will mean that uh, users won't have to keep rerunning the uh, the balancer, say if the PG auto scaler kicks in, um, or if there's a change to the number of PGs in their cluster, things like that. Um, and we haven't uh, decided the the really fine grained specifics yet, but the high level idea is it would either run at a at a set cadence or it would. Uh, run and say every time the OSD map changes or something like that, um, respond to triggers. Um, but uh, that's kind of the general idea. Okay. And, um, yeah, if there are any questions about it um, or any ideas about it, let me know. But right now it's a uh, um, in, in discussion and will be uh, going to, into development. Yeah, given that we know that people have already started playing with the read balancer offline method, I think it's going to be a useful addition that will be welcomed by users. So looking forward to it. Cool. Um, if no objection, I'm moving to next uh, uh, to next item. Okay, on the list we have uh, uh, MG, uh, we have the tracking of, uh, of availability over prolonged uh, periods of times of time. Uh, right now, when you we 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 have the facilities uh, to observe uh, the state of the cluster, the state of the cluster. Maybe even to derive uh, some basic. Uh, uh, metric, but in a very focused, very narrow, in a point in time. The idea is to extend uh, this to uh, to entire uh, dimension, uh, to entire spectrum, to entire prolonged of uh, likely period of time. However, I'm not sure it's uh, uh, so that that the requirements are already gathered. Uh, what will be the metric? what we want, uh, uh, what we mean by availability. I think this requires, uh, uh, this requires a lot of input uh, from, uh, from the community, from, uh, from developers. Uh, we can start here, and, but I think we will likely move uh, to CDM. But well, we have, we have some time. We, we, we are at a pretty uh, good pace, so. Yeah, I, I can add to that. So um, I've sent out a survey um, like a long time ago um, and asking users and developers about what do they mean by availability. And um, a lot of them said that um, um, it's the ability to serve IO with reasonable 
performance. And currently, I have a PR that is in the works. Um, it is usable, but um, there are some optimization that needs to be um, done. Um, some of the calculations are in the manager side, and I kind of want to move everything to like the monitor side and everything for optimization. But OK, the general idea is that um, we track availability um, as a per pool cases. Um, this is because um, we're going to track like PGs in each pool. And how we define if a pool is unavailable is that if a PG is in the state of incomplete or down, um, then we immediately mark it as unavailable and we start tracking it. Or um, if a PG is stuck in the state of inactive, stale, and peering for more than 60 seconds, we also um, mark it as unavailable. And obviously, that 60 seconds, like we call it PG stuck threshold, can be changed and configured by the user. Um, but the reason we kind of track availability for each pool is because some of the pools, um, the user, um, the user can choose which pool do they really care about, um, so that um, they're like they're flexible and like you know the data is not just tracking every single pool. I still think that you know maybe there is a better way um, to do it or to define availability. So I'll I'll leave it to um, you guys or other people to discuss um, if this if this makes sense or not. Yeah, I think it makes sense to start with something that's a simple formula and then um, add to it maybe in a future release, um, but get, getting down like the basic definition of what we're looking for. And then um, you can, uh, I think, just start from just trying to get everything all at once. Um, since it's such a complicated thing to define, define um, availability. So I think your current approach is uh, a good approach. Yeah, so, I uh, agree with uh, what Laura said because you know different uh, you know if you have different people they'll have different uh, perception of availability and we got kind of got a feeling of that from the survey you did right uh, but it's it's probably important to lay the foundation for something super basic and then like take into account you know you know some sort of layers that we can add to it like okay what does it mean if we are evaluating the availability of an RGW cluster how do we do that for example and you know how do we do other things but maybe start just at at, at the radius level and like the what the OSD understand the PG metadata level and, and start out there and then you know take the next step. This sounds like uh, how we envision that the availability marking uh, uh, function is going to evolve, is going to change. Maybe when we will uh, want to have in, uh, it in multiple tastes, in multiple variants. Uh, the thing I would uh, uh, I personally perceive at the very, at the very first glance uh, as important is uh, availability of data for those function uh, to calculate uh, from. I would try to have this uh, uh, quite. I will try to have quite a broad set of data, uh, OSD maps, etc., uh, available uh, for uh, this function to uh, to provide to to summarize into a metric. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't uh, try to save uh, some data dependencies here. What do you exactly mean by data dependency? Well, uh, let's say you have a function. Uh, its output mm -hmm. is um, it's mar it's uh, uh, just just a metric. It's available. Uh, let's say uh, available over uh, nine, nine, 99 percent of uh, uh, of time, and there there must be input. How you are uh, input you are using to uh, to calculate this metric, the input this function, and as initial glance maybe some metrics from uh, from uh, like like uh, some data from uh, OSD map about availability of OSDs, maybe some perf counters. I don't know. 
but yeah, I will try to think about the, 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 the uh, I will try to think to, about the arguments to this function. Right. I think this is another perfect topic for another CDM uh, based on feedback you have gathered. But just to like close this topic, I guess uh, the data that we were looking at earlier was the PG states. In what states is a PG actually able to access data versus not? So that's a clear discrimination, right? So uh, let's uh, again move this topic uh, to CDM. Clearly, there are lots of thoughts and opinions here as to what a POC should look like. Okay, uh, let's switch to uh, to another item. Uh, next one uh, uh, is uh, about uh, the uh, easy climb mode. Uh, actually, the testing of it. It was uh, uh, it was uh, brought uh, some time ago. Uh, now it looks we are going to reiterate it. But I would love to hear about uh, uh, about uh, uh, the community community. Uh, demand uh, for uh, for it. Yeah, I added it because this is kind of a spill from Reef. We did some work in Reef in terms of extending test coverage, and Nitsan has been playing around with it, and even um, started doing some basic evaluation around measuring performance improvements with this uh, profile. Um, but I guess the general question is probably we should continue that effort. Uh, but you know, I don't have any, uh, you know, any data that says that we really, really should go start supporting this. But maybe we should just continue that effort and you know see if this is a potential uh, for something that we can experimentally start supporting uh, in in real clusters. So far, no negative news about this. Uh, the last time we did some research, so no news is probably good news. Uh, but yeah, the idea would be to continue investing in this. And given that Squid has a six-month cycle, probably not a great idea to target this, supporting this for Squid. So maybe the next release is a good target, but we can put incremental effort in this release. OK. Uh, sounds like we tackled it. Uh, next uh, big thing, uh, uh, scrap. Scrap enhancements. They were, uh, we, we were already talking about, uh, about them. A lot uh, during the uh, uh, during the session in Amsterdam, uh, but uh, Ronan, maybe there is uh, uh, something new, something you want to like to uh, add, uh, something we would like update on. Not a lot to update. Um, and first, sorry, I didn't have time to create the Trello. It uh, is I will do it uh, in a couple of days. Basically, what I plan and I want to do is to complete the testing and approval of the SCUB scheduler, the new SCUB scheduler, which opens uh, the way to behavioral and, this, and the control changes that we want to do, or I think we want to do. Some of them are not yet uh, fully designed. Uh, or there's no agreement on, on how to do them. Specific, specifically, uh, something that was mentioned in Amsterdam, uh, scrub resource counting and allocation, giving uh, priority, uh, cluster-wide priority to high-priority scrubs, uh, making a more, con allowing a more control to the operator in, in extreme cases, for example. There is, this is something that we more or less have a full design and uh, implementation is easy once the scheduler is in. Um, there is an issue of deep scuff scheduling algorithm. It's easy, but we should discuss, uh, agree on what to do there. And uh, then uh, have this uh, implemented. And there are some, I have a backlog of timeouts that I promised the various customers to add to the system to catch errors, either scrub uh, prob uh, problems or other problems that cause scrubs to uh, get uh, frozen and uh, uh, sometimes cause a whole, uh, a, a large part of the uh, cluster to not uh, being scrubbed. All this is, I hope I didn't, 
I have a feeling I missed a few things, but uh, I hope to get all these uh, in, uh, in time for uh, we'll see. They are all overdue. That's it. Cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, any questions? If not, then uh, let me uh, move to the next one, which is about uh, uh, multi-step. Uh, well, it's, a, it's about a tracker. We added it uh, uh, recently. Uh, it looks like a feature request. Uh, uh, create multi-step Azure uh, profile from CLI. It looks like somebody, uh, it's like, like it's about user experience, about squeezing uh, two steps uh, into one comment. And the process of making it a bit more uh, more complex. Overall, I mean, if we preserve compatibility, I don't uh, see a reason why not. Uh, but uh, uh, well, if there is, we would really appreciate any feedback. How uh, how useful uh, uh, this really is. Uh, how uh, what would be the priority worth assigning to it? Uh, moderately high. So there are some. There's some cluster situations where we want to be able to use erasure coding on a very small cluster. And for cost reasons, this we're kind of forced up into the um, M equals K over two family of codes. And so if you do something like an eight plus six code, or not that, but sorry, like an eight plus six code on four nodes, if you spread those 14 OSDs over the four nodes evenly, then you can survive. Uh, I'm just going out of memory here, but I think I'm right. The the death of one one host and one OSD, which is fairly good properties. Um, the problem is that at the moment there's no way to express the that crush rule, which would be step take um, host then take three OSD, not an OSD. Um, there's no way to express that with the current erasure code profile system, so you need to create a custom cross rule, which is a little bit much for users. Um, I think one strategy here is actually just to create a special profile property that just hydrates that exact rule. Um, I don't think we actually want users, for the most part, handcrafting these things because they're relatively complicated. So we can just create a few of these specific erasure code profiles that are created up front and add documentation for each one individually. Because once there are enough hosts, you don't do anything like this. You actually do a normal crush rule. So this is really a small cluster property. So I don't think we need to handle the general case. We can just create several specific ones. Likely to be more, more understandable to users anyway. The simpler, the better. And I, I agree with everything Sam said. Okay. The underlying mechanism should perhaps be general, but I mean, it's pretty much just creating a crush rule. So I don't know that there's much point in generalizing it. But yeah, the, clearly, as Sam mentioned, the motivation is smaller clusters. Maybe this is a use case that maybe upstream, uh, a lot of upstream mm -hmm. community members can benefit from. And maybe having, uh, they are going through the extra effort of creating those manually. I don't know that that's, uh, but uh, maybe this is a, a something we, we should share with the community and say that, hey, we are doing this, would, would this be of any use in case people have We should back. definitely put it. Bluntly, we should definitely put it up, up upstream. If there are customers yep. who wanted it, follows likely that there are users yep. who want it too. And yep. even, even if there weren't, we need to maintain it either way. So, yeah. All right. Exactly. I'm just saying it may be a welcome change for them, though they didn't particularly request it. I suspect it actually is. It's if we add documentation for these things, I think people will actually use it. There are, I think, small clusters are not un unpopular. Yep. And being able to avoid 3x replication for non-performance sensitive object clusters of that size would be nice. This would be another area, incidentally, where config profiles would be useful. The tuning for blue store is going to be a little different in these uh, scenarios, although we probably won't bother with that for now. So having a profile that could go along with this would... That's exactly what I was thinking. Matan, you got your another use case just mm -hmm. right away. But I mean, it's, it's the same kind of deal. It would be yet another set of config keys that are primarily in Blue Store. 
Guys, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm going to push you out to CDN. We uh, have uh, uh, just three minutes and uh, a topic, uh, I think uh, Yuval's one, about the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, tracing uh, that is related to MOSD op, uh, re uh, uh, revert, and uh, uh, it's about tracing. Uh, Yuval, do you want to, uh, to say a word about, about this feature? I don't think he's on the call anymore. I saw him initially. I think he dropped. I think uh, I saw Deepika on the call. Deepika, maybe you want to shed some light on this? Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, loud and clearly. Oh, great. Uh, I'm not sure what you all had in mind, but last time we discussed that uh, was in KubeCon. And uh, basically, uh, maybe extending the traces would be a good point. Uh, right now, I think uh, you all presented a talk as well on it, like, highlighting how um, the uh, like code path, uh, how RGW uh, was traversing through the, the whole, like just profiling uh, with another tool to have just see the energy impact. Uh, it's about cross. Uh, it's uh, uh, sorry for interrupting. I think it's about uh, uh, about uh, tracing across uh, multiple demons. S uh, operation oh. that starts basically in a within RGW and it's reflected. Yeah. It has some impact yeah. on OSD. And we want to associate uh, uh, the, the RGW part with the underlying OSD part. And this was actually uh, merged. Uh, but it got a revert because of uh, breaking the uh, encoding of MOSD op. And to spoke with that, we introduced. Uh, uh, I started. Spoke, I started uh, the PR that brings the support for uh, uh, for uh, uh, Squid, uh, and mm -hmm. introduces the server uh, feature bit uh, the uh, Uval is uh, is basing on. Uh, I think that's that's all. Yeah, in, maybe. Uh, the question that's is about. Uh, sorry, please go on. Yeah. No, no, I think uh, that's uh, that's a connecting point uh, that like will give us the end-to-end -end tracing picture, maybe how we can proceed from there in OSD side of things. We, uh, yeah, and maybe even uh, Casey uh, or anybody else had any uh, context more, um, they can highlight more. Or we can discuss this on in CDM as well. Uh, CDM likely, and my, the, the sole question uh, I have is, uh, well, my mental state is that uh, mm -hmm. as we uh, as uh, uh, the uh, server underscore squid is already introduced and uh, the comics uh, mm -hmm. are uh, are in the Uval's PR, I think we don't need to hurry up with uh, the uh, it's not the top priority. Let's let's uh, phrase that word that way uh, to bring uh, uh, to bring the full squid kick of PR. If I'm wrong, I'm perfectly happy to focus uh, uh, to focus on it. Yeah, but no, yeah, I would I would agree yeah. with Go that. Ahead. I think yeah. uh, Uval's main priority is just getting unblocked on the feature bit part. Yeah, I think we all agree that it was a good idea, and we wanted to do it, which just has a dependency on the service squid, which is now in his PR. So I think this is on track, and I believe uh, Uval will also create a Trello card describing what the scope of this PR is. So that'll be nice. So. Cool. Okay, the very last uh, uh, topic uh, on the on the agenda is about uh, multi-tenancy stats per namespace. Uh, I recall that uh, uh, Josh uh, was uh, uh, was saying about uh, it someday. Josh, would you like uh, to uh, to throw some light on it? Yeah, sure. So we talked about this a bit at the developer summit at Cephalagon, but not everybody was there. So I wanted to bring us up here again. I think we'll probably need to discuss it in more depth at a CDM. I'll just be brief today. The, it, the idea is to um, support multi-tenancy um, the rate of name spaces by having like a, a tenant map to a rate of name space and track different properties of the tenants. Uh, like resource usage, be it, whether it's um, like on a space based amount of potentially amount of IOPS maybe even going down to the granularity of CPU or memory if you wanted to do more intensive performance analysis, that's probably a later thing. But just tracking stats in general on a permanent space basis and um, 
potentially even enforcing a quota, similar to what we do for like the MDS, where we we um, are kind of report those stats asynchronously to the manager and, and kind of get an update from the manager level, maybe a, um, on an asynchronous basis to, to the OSDs or maybe to the monitors. We have to discuss that more um, to be able to prevent client uh, clients or our given tenants from using too much of a different resource. I think this is what may also tie into QoS as well. Um, but I think it can be a pretty, pretty useful thing in general. Well, looks, uh, well, looks, we are done. Is there anything, uh, uh, is there any question, any extra topic, uh, anything that uh, uh, is worth, uh, uh, is worth uh, uh, saying a word or sentence right now? Okay. Yeah. Looks. Uh, looks. Uh, the radio part is uh, uh, is done. I'm passing the. I'm passing the mic to you. Thanks, Radek. Just three minutes over time, so we did pretty well. Sorry. From what I thought initially, no, it's it's pretty good. Uh, I remember having gone like 15 minutes over last time, so this is much better. All right then. Thank you everybody for joining, and we will continue with the series sessions tomorrow, day after, and then the last one is on Monday. So take care, everyone. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. See you later.